Can I have your attention? So we're ready to start. Um, welcome to the salon. This is about rethinking education. We have uh, four amazing speakers, and we have Willow uh, joining us remotely, and Tamar and Excel joining us remotely as well. Now, a few technical issues, just so you guys understand what's going on here. We will um, be having this Google Hangout um, live all the time, and Adam and Molly will be using some slides during their presentation. So I'm just going to switch to that, and you will see only the slides. But that doesn't mean that the Google Hangout is turned off. It's still live streaming, so um, that's just for you to know. And anybody who is joining remotely online right now can just uh, contribute and uh, write down their comments and questions in the Q&A section. So Willow, I'll leave this to you. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to try to facilitate remotely. We'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to trust that you all will uh, make it work. Uh, so we're going to do some introductions in just a moment, and then we'll hear some quick talks, and then we're going to do the regular breakout group thing, unless we come up with, with a, another fancy, fancy plan. Uh, thank you for letting me join you from San Francisco. I'm really excited about today. I always love the Nexi salons, but today is about education, and this is something that I think everyone has to interact with in some way in their life, and everyone agrees is broken. Um, and so unlike having to persuade people that change needs to happen, we already have that buy-in. So I'm really excited about the diversity of perspectives that we'll hear from today, and I'm really excited to see also how we can see how those overlap and how they might work together. Um, so you'll hear from Adam, who works at a group called Facing History. Uh, he'll tell you all about it. Um, you'll hear from Molly from Open edX. You'll hear from Tamara uh, from a, an online school that's accredited for K through 8. And you'll hear from Debbie, who is from Olin College. Um, with that said, let's. I, I probably won't be able to hear you, sadly, but uh, everybody, if you can go around and say who you are, how you're doing, and let's say the color of crayon you wished existed. Um, that's Crayola crayon. I'm, I'm from the Midwest, so I say crayon like a cranberry, but you know what I mean. A color you wish existed in a color packet. I'll slowly turn this around. Anybody's okay? Everybody's okay with being filmed? Okay. All right. There it is. There we are. Okay. Where should we start? Paul. Well, uh, I was trying to think of a color. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Paul. I'm from Mexi. Uh, how are you doing? This? Oh, I'm doing good. <laughs> More shades of green, I think, are needed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who we have? I'm Matthew. I'm the science writer at Mexi. <laughs> Back there, sir. Hi, I'm Robert, doing fine. I'd like to see the old color play. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an intern at Nexi. I'm fine and uh, blue violet color. Hi, I'm Francisco. I was up here in Nexi. I'm doing fine. And, uh, I don't know, chessboard, white and black. Uh, I'm Jen. I'm a I am Rick. I work for Ada Consulting Firm in Boston. I'm doing well today, and if I picked a color, it would be double blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Sorry, know what that means. <laughs> Use your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. <laughs> I think y'all are just saying these things, but your dress is, is a very good shade, also. <laughs> I'm Rada Dermatology Color uh, from BU, and my favorite color is sky blue. Anybody? Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the Blanc. I work at edX as the community coordinator for the Open edX project. Uh, we're pretty stressful right now because we're 
don't have a contract sign that would really need signs, so I'd say that I'm stressed. Uh, and I would really love a color that is is the the green of um, birch trees in the springtime. Very light. I'm, um, I would like a very pale summer. Yeah. Um, I never know how to answer that. <laughs> 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 um, I uh, I'm working on two projects in the I am Adam. How are you doing? I'm from Pacing History and there's uh, maybe maybe uh, color the the color plan here. <laughs> right. I'm I'm Brad, I'm a management consultant, but I live in Maine and I'm doing a very very good video. My favorite fruit, raspberry. Hello. <laughs> um I'm Debbie Chapter and I'm here from Oldman College. Um I'm doing fun today. Um, I would like an entire box of crayons and then pass it off to the Hello, like <laughs> uh, Maya, former Nexi, currently a science communication initiative and an education initiative. And I would like a mood crayon that changes color based on your mood. Nice. Hi, my name is Alfredo. I'm a full talk in Nexi, and I like the papaya orange. I am uh, Jakob, I'm visiting Nexi, I'm at the Potsdam Institute for Private Impact Research in Germany. Uh, I'll say introvert. <laughs> I'm Arnon, I'm an avid outdoorsman, and I'd like a camouflage cup. <laughs> I'm Bjorn Ullman, I'm a postdoc here at Nexi, and yeah, I'll go with clear. We don't want to miss somebody who just joined us. If you could introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about your favorite color, Willow. That was a question about favorite color. The color, yeah. a new color to do. Oh, a new crayon. color oh, for yeah. a crayon. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mubalaji. Hello, I'm a master student at MIT in Technology and Policy Program. Uh, probably bluish yellow. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I will introduce myself. I'm Mubalaji. I'm a president of the Uniform Systems Institute. We're doing very well because the paper that we put out yesterday achieved good attention, and it's an important paper on Ebola response. And I will say that I will go along with the forest for new shades of blue. <laughs> We've done it, Tamara. How about you? Okay, so Tamara Excel, um, and by the way, the school is K through 12th grade. We're fully accredited. <laughs> With diploma so granting as well. No, no, that's fine. Um, I'd like to see Mother of Pearl added somehow. Nice. Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, not all the shades of blue. I mean, you look at my wardrobe, you're going to see blues and purples. But yeah, if you, I want, I want that Mother of Pearl added to my crayon box. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna riff on that and have the that butterfly that's blue purple. That'd be my jam. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be gorgeous. <laughs> so thank you, thank you everyone. Um, Yanir, do you want to say anything before we jump in? Um, thank you. Um, so I think for, from my perspective, the session is very exciting. We've been, um, for a, a bunch of years, been approached by people in education to talk about complex systems implications for education. Um, we've done some thinking about it, and maybe I'll share a few thoughts about it at, at the end. But I think the important thing is that there's really a, um, a, um, a new, I think, energy that is going into innovation and education in recent years, and I'm really excited to learn about them. So I think that's good. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, um, Adam, let's lead with you, and then Molly would love to hear from you. Uh, then, since Debbie has, in fact, arrived, I was uh, she was coming from a ways away. She can go third, and then Tamara, if you'll go fourth. 
then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll uh, we'll do some some breakout sessions. And so each of these talks should take ten minutes, maybe a little bit less. I don't have any way of signaling, so I've I've given it to Kate to to perhaps be more assertive with you than she than than might usually happen to to cut you off, but I trust that you all are awesome and stuff. So Adam, I'm really excited to hear this and I'm gonna hide over here on the internet now. Bye. Willow, can I just make sure that the that um, the presentation is shared with everybody that you can see it? Adam's presentation on scripted edu education? Can yep, you it's up it's up now. It should be projected. All right, so we are no longer be, we will not be able to see you. We're going to see Adam's presentation, and then we'll get back to you after it's done. Great. So really, do give me a sense of time as we're going because I'm working hard on putting my phone away. Oh, okay. So do give me a sense of time because I, I'm working on putting my phone away. I've got this bad habit. organization that's been around for about 40 years and we've been really human centered we, as, your, as an organization what we do and I'll kind of get into this in the presentation is we teach teachers how to teach that's what we really do best and what we treat, teach them to teach about is kind of moral and ethical issues we use history and work from the humanities as a way to get them to do that but what we've done and I'll give you our model a little bit but what we've done is been helping teachers one by one individually because we thought that teachers deserved the respect, the attention, to be treated as professionals. Sometimes we think what we do is offer grand rounds for teachers and helping them in the way that doctors get attention in their practice, which is often ignored. So what does it mean when we've been given this opportunity? They say, yo, your work is amazing. You guys have great results. So we want you to now all of a sudden double the number of teachers and students that you're working with. And not only that, that's really not even thinking very ambitiously. Think very, very different about the scale. You guys have great ability to make an impact, so make an impact. So what I'm going to do is show you a little bit about kind of the, the parameters of how we think about education. And then I want to say wait. Sorry, uh, here on the Hangout, we're only getting black screen. I know that you probably switched to full screen mode. Will you just make it really big in the screen instead of fill screen? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We were just trying to check if everything is all right, but thank you for telling us. Uh, OK, it's all good right. now, right? OK. So I just kind of want to do this quickly, but just to give you a sense uh, of, of our model because I think it'll help you think about what can be systematized, what can be broken down, and then what actually has to be kind of tailored and customized. Because what we do is I think what we do best is teach teachers to make complex choices about the kind of resources that they present for the material, but within a structured model. So the model starts by having people think about, having young people actually, think about all the different factors that shape their decisions. Right, to think about the relationship between the individual and society. Then we have people thinking about how groups start to impact, again, the choices that we make and how groups have historically been, uh, how, how groups have historically responded to difference and where some of those ideas of difference have come from. And then our work often goes into deep, deep case studies, just trying to look how those ideas have played out over time. The work that we're probably most known for is looking at how a democracy uh, really unfolded, actually, how, how the, the democracy in Weimar, Germany, ended up at a dictatorship and ended up in the Holocaust. It's not the only work we do, but it's an example. And what we're doing is, in that time, you're not really trying to teach just the impact of the end result, but trying to understand the small steps, the choices that ordinary people made, and the forces that shaped the decisions that ordinary people have made. And so what we do is we have young people wrestle with dilemmas and context. We look at the legacy of those issues and have kids think complicated ways about issues of judgment and responsibility, and then really return to thinking about their own role in society. At the beginning, they're thinking about the forces that are shaping men. We want kids at the end of it, after looking at the story, to start to think about how can they actually start to make a more positive difference in their communities and in the world, right? So we're trying to move kids broader. In each, of these, in each of these lessons, each of these student conversations, is really trying to do some balance between some serious intellectual rigor, some ethical reflection, and emotional engagement. And we're really looking for this to happen in every classroom conversation, 
And even that looks a little bit more formulaic than really what happens, because the teacher is always reading your students, always reading your class. Actually, there's all these stories. You guys probably know this. Teachers make about a, a thousand choices in a classroom a day, a day. Those aren't things that you program ahead of time. That's about reading how, stu how students are responding to each other. So, ooh, new slide. I don't know where that came from. So I just thought I'd give you the model because, again, what I'm going to ask you all to do is to t break down a model and start to think about how what, what might work as you start to go to scale. So when people study how you actually make a difference with teachers, you say that you actually provide them three different things if you're looking for deep change. You look for you providing professional development for teachers. That's not enough on your own. You need to provide engaging resources for teachers. And then you need to put them in a community that supports that kind of learning, right? Because some often schools are pretty often pretty systematized, and that's not these kind of goals about thinking about moral and ethical reflection aren't necessarily the top of the game for a lot of schools. It's not how schools get measured. So what we're asking teachers at schools to do is try to break the rules a little bit and change change what they think the classroom is for. And so what we know is by adding these adding these pieces into the mix, and this is what we study. You get more effective teachers, more engaged students, a different classroom climate, and all kinds of really lovely student outcomes, ranging from kind of sense of civic agency to social and emotional development, kids thinking more maturely about the choices that they make in their own lives, as well as the intellectual skills and moral and ethical reasoning skills. And so that's 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 been our pot. And then the model has been, again, te teacher by teacher by teacher. So if somebody goes to a workshop, professional development, they get signed one staff member, and that staff member becomes their lifetime coach. And so, you know, that that's a lot of work. So now we have a network that, uh, depending on what, if you're looking for the broadest measure or the deepest measure, a network of about 90,000 teachers reaching about 3.5 million kids around the world. And again, our challenge, and I like the challenge, is to go bust that wide open, you know, really change how, how you start to have, have an impact. I went... I was going to show you a short little video piece, but let's take a look and see how, the, how we're doing on time. It may give you a sense at the end. But these are some of the core beliefs that we're working with as we're trying to think about scaling and changing our delivery method. We think that teachers are adult learners, and therefore you don't just kind of pro give them something to plug in in their classroom. This isn't video for day one. That you really are trying to teach teachers to make complicated choices based on the situations in their classroom. Does that make sense what I'm saying? There's a different group of kids. This group of kids in period one is a different group of kids than in period three. So the same resource, the same reading, you might want to either you want to change it up or you might deliver that information a different way. That's not actually what educational reform is looking like for a lot of people in the country right now. A lot of people are saying, give them all the same stuff. Plug this in, give them all the same stuff. We, so we believe in working with, not around teachers. We also believe that adolescents are budding moral philosophers. So therefore, when things are getting noisy in the classroom, that's a really good thing. So and that means that we want people's ideas getting tested around and getting pushed around in the inside of a classroom. We believe that universal insights come through looking at particular details. You know, so it's you don't if you want a kid to have a global perspective, sometimes you think you just teach them, try to teach them everything. And actually, that doesn't work very well because you need to understand the context of different stories, right? Depth, depth over breadth. And then part of being a good teacher is just customizing your curriculum. And the other really arrogant belief is that we believe that we have a pedagogical model that works. So while we want to give people a lot of choice, we also believe that they should be making choice within a model. There is a system that we're trying to teach people to work with them. And so. We've been thinking about how in the world do you scale that model? So we've been doing a lot of this stuff on the far right. We've been doing a lot of centralized work. You know, with one, we have what we call program associates. We have program associates. Each one is now working with about 200 teachers. And that's how we thought we would grow. We start, how do we start to move to a decentralized model? What sort of pieces of our work can we start to give away to other different leaders, right? Whether it's been a training, a trainer model, or what is it? What is? But what does it really mean for us to really distribute the way the professional development that we offer so teachers become coaches for for themselves? And so I'm really, I'm really just throwing out some challenges that I that I thought I could have you wrestle with. I'm I have some answers and my own thoughts about a lot of this stuff. But I think this is all revolving around a number of questions that I think that we're 
that we're struggling with, which is what does technology enable us to do differently that we haven't been a able to do before? One of the, one of the uh, biggest challenges that you're going to find right now, at least for us, is getting people on professional development is actually getting released from class time. So to actually come to professional development opportunities. So does technology give you a workaround? Uh, how, how, so a second question related is how did digital technologies meet the realities that teachers face both in positive ways but also negative ways? Often sitting in schools where all kinds of things are blocked, like from social networks to YouTube to, to, to Facebook. To, and some of that's changing, but not, not, not always, especially when you're talking on a massive scale. Right? School systems are slow. Uh, what's the role of the teacher? In other words, what if I'm trying to develop a curriculum model, so my job is a guy who designs all of our resources. We don't believe in handing people <coughs> big units of information. So again, we're looking for them to create their own story, their own, their own resources through the material. So as we start to think about scale, you're working with trying to train teachers, and you're trying to train, train them to do two things, no content, but also to be great facilitators of discussion that kind of build student leadership. So what is it, how do you balance what a teacher needs to know? Do they need to be a historical content expert? Or is that, is that, yeah, got it. Is that stuff that we can start to give away? So how do, how do teachers balance, balance their time? So what kind of, so what needs to happen actually in a classroom? And what can happen outside of the classroom? You know, there's some interesting things happening with flipped classrooms, right, where you start to think about you know, do you take the core knowledge, the core historical background, so when you're spending your time in a classroom, it can be a much more customized conversation. So it's playing with some of these ideas. So what kinds of educational content can be systematized? And then how can you support, this is the thing that I think I'm most troubled by, which is that we also have a model that says you teach these units and the change that we measure is about a four to six week implementation. We also know that there's all kinds of pressure from people who do sorts of different things in the classroom. So starting to think a little bit outside the box, which is that what happens if you don't get that 46 weeks anymore? And so what, what, what can you do outside of the classroom to support those larger learning goals? You know, are there other things that you can do? And that, you know, I'm, I throw these just as questions for people to consider. If, if, you know, in questions and answer, I can go in far more depth. But instead of kind of throwing out all the big picture, I thought it would be worthwhile looking at an organization that we have a good reputation, but, we're, but I think we're at a crisis point. Because if we're going to try to really scale up, we're concerned that you're going to lose that human touch that we had when we were in that, in that model, in the, in the, the centralized model. So that's, that's kind of the end of some stuff for you all to chew on, and we can talk more later. Willow, shall we do questions, or? Yeah, do, do three questions. Let's take three questions. Willow, is that what you wanted me to do? That was so good. Thank you, Adam. I really I enjoy the um, talking about what you already do and the models that you have and the challenges you're facing. You did good. Thank right. you. I need to blow us encouragement. <laughs> Anybody has a question? Yeah. I was wondering about the uh, teachers' unions and any kind of assistance or interference you get. It's actually really interesting. That's all. It's it's interesting. The relationships change when it's something that's mandated by the district. That's where teachers unions have sometimes been an issue. But when it's teachers coming to this material on their own, you'd be amazed at the amount of time, way beyond anything that anybody asks them to do, that they would spend that they would spend with us. So there, there, there is something about the nature of the bureaucracy that becomes problematic. I, but I wouldn't say the teachers' unions have been a problem, but those big contracts do have rules with them. And then I think the more you become systematized, the more you start to become just a piece of that bureaucracy versus working with those passionate individuals. Yeah. How much have you seen teachers taking the the distributed and decentralized methodologies that you've been using into their classrooms. In, inside their, inside yeah. of their own classroom. That's actually really interesting. I think, I think a fair amount we're not great at documenting it. Uh, I think it, we, we had this wonderful team, which we couldn't get funding to sustain, called the Digital uh, Innovation Network. And these people were doing really interesting 
things going on. But and we were starting to document that work. Couldn't sustain it uh, financially. And so we're losing we're losing that documentation. What I am seeing now is a lot of teachers doing outside of our own place, doing professional development for other teachers. All kinds of really interesting things. Again, we're not always able to follow it all, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Could you give an example of outside the classroom? What, what? Yeah. So. Um, Was this question clear? Yeah. This is, this would be like question three, right? Yeah. What What's happening outside of the classroom? So So Scott Osterwell at MIT has been talking a lot about games and learning. And one of the things that really interesting is what role should games play? Is that what games should be doing inside of the classroom? One of the things that Scott has talked about that I think is really brilliant, actually, is how can you use games to kind of keep the larger ideas that you're trying to get in, in the curriculum? You know, that's what the game should be doing. You're playing, you're playing the game all along outside of the classroom that are kind of reinforcing the values, but not necessarily teaching content knowledge, but really it's, it's practicing the skills. And then every, and teaching, what you do is you teach the teacher every once in a while how to start to make that connection. So it becomes informal gameplay that's reinforcing some of the some of the larger goals of the classroom. That's something I'm really interested in, and it's also something I haven't seen done very well, except for occasional. They've done some cool things in science. Anyway, that's too much of me. We'll talk more with other people later. Thank you, Adam. Thanks. Well, so Willow, who should we have next? Let's have Molly up next. Molly. Um, Please join us. Uh, I will um, pull up your presentation. Um, I recently learned last week that we actually have a trademark on the phrase open edX, which means I have to use it as an adjective. So I'm probably going to say open platform a whole lot because I'm trying to get used to that. It's kind of disturbing. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, well, I will be sharing the screen. Um, um, I can use, should I just start talking or should I? Uh, you can continue talking. I'm just um, fixing um, So I work for edX. Uh, how many of you guys know what edX is? Oh, great. That's really cool. Um, edX is uh, an online education project. Um, it's most famous as this website where there are okay. classes you can take. Most of them are designed by universities um, and university faculty. Uh, this, is, this is built on something called the Open edX platform, powered by Open edX. Um, so if you go to edX.org, this is what the website looks like. Um, and there are courses, and you go through it. And you know, recently, we did this really wonderful partnership with Arizona State University, um, which is offering a low-risk freshman year of classes. Um, you take the class. If you pass it, uh, you can then pay for the credits. But if you don't pass it, you don't have to pay for the credits. Um, so there's a lot of really great <coughs> stuff about that. Uh, this is what my side of the project kind of looks like, uh, which is a GitHub page uh, where people are storing the code that they're using to develop the platform. This is actually what a whole lot of it looks like, which is just a bunch of files. Um, so what the platform does is it's, it's used to supply courses uh, to people. A lot of these are, include video. There are audio files. Um, there are different kinds of questions and interactions. There's interactions between students and faculty. Uh, currently, there is not real-time support for this. Um, people have done other things. Uh, a really popular thing is people having Google Hangouts with their students, either as broadcasts um, or as conversations in smaller groups. Uh, really delightful things have come up with people doing like meetups. Um, Stanley is currently teaching a course with the Smithsonian on comic books. Uh, and meetup groups have all over the place for that. Um, and so this is kind of what the platform looks like. And the platform is being implemented uh, all over the world in a lot of different places for people using it uh, in very different contexts. Um, uh, quick look at some number of stuff is there are 108 verified sites. And what that means is those are people I have talked to. And I can point you to their website, and I can say this is what they do, and they will verify that this is what they do. Um, there are 1,300 courses. Those are courses that we're not running. So those are just people out there somewhere that we have no clue how they got there. We have no say in what they're doing. Um, so we've counted there 14 different languages. Uh, this includes Basque and Catalan, which I think is really exciting. We have one Norwegian site. Um, and here's an incomplete list of those people. Uh, it's a lot of text on the slide. I'm told that's very bad form, but um, kind of gives you an idea of this that I think is really delightful. Um, 
So what I think is really interesting and exciting about the platform, I'm going to spend maybe three minutes talking about this, uh, is different kinds of use cases you see. Um, so there are universities. There are a lot of universities using it. Some of them are using it externally facing, uh, meaning that they're making their courses and they're putting them out there the same way that someone would do on our website. Uh, there's also a lot of internal use. Um, what this looks like at MIT, for example, is in some cases people are just taking classes online. Uh, this is being used for students studying abroad or in order for students to kind of try to manipulate their schedules in different ways that will work better for them. Uh, there are also uses where people are doing their lectures in the, uh, at home and then classroom time, it's like it's a flip classroom model. So classroom time is being spent um, doing more uh, interactions, more workshopping together, more problem sets. Um, one of my favorite little examples of this is one class that ditched the textbook and they replaced that with extra lectures online and they found that students were watching them more than they'd been reading the textbook, uh, which has great results. Um, there is a nonprofit in DC that is currently using it to do financial and nutrition education uh, among minority families of lower income households. Uh, and that's been doing some really wonderful things. They have very positive results occurring right now. Um, there's a lot of corporate internal training. Uh, and my favorite personal example is someone who wanted to take the Russian method of teaching mathematics, which is very unique, and tailor it for American audiences. Uh, so you can find that too if you want your kids to, to learn about uh, math, a Russian style. Um, and then here are some things that I think about a lot, and these are things that keep me up at night, uh, which is how far can this be pushed, right? So still the most common use case is universities making courses that they're usually giving to other people, right? I want to know what else we can do. I want to think how can this be leveraged in different ways? How can this have a greater impact? Um, because I don't necessarily believe that the impact is going to be universities throwing things out there. Uh, I think the impact is going to come from places like the nonprofit that is doing financial education training and nutrition education training. Uh, I think impact can come from ways that, for example, maybe teachers are interacting with each other using it. That's like a really great example. Um, so that comes into who needs to be using this, right? Not just who is already, but like who are these people out there who aren't interacting with this at all? And who can be learning from it, who isn't already learning from it, right? Most of the users we see overall, and not just of in, well, this is also of people installing and implementing the platform, is most of them are white, most of them are men, most of them are college educated, most of them are middle class. Uh, which actually ties into the third point, which is not, or the final point, which is not just digital accessibility, but ac ac access to resources, right? This is a huge problem. We're making these great things. I think they're great. We're throwing them out there. Maybe you can't actually use them. Um, Average policy and impact, and what tools and features are needed, right? We have the system. There is a lot of different stuff going into it. I'm happy to talk about that ad nauseum. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have everything we need, or we have, maybe we have things we don't need. Maybe we're lacking, lacking connectivity that really needs to be there. Uh, and this would extend beyond just, well, I really need a, a thing that will let me teach protein folding better. Um, but it could look more like I need, really need a way for students who are having problems with this particular type of math to be able to interact with students who are succeeding at that particular type of math. Um, so that's, that was as quick as I could summarize it. Mostly my goal here was to kind of give you an idea of what I think about and what I talk about um, and sort of a context to uh, approach it from. Do people have questions? Questions? Any questions? So one of the things I, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about, first of all, I know Nan. Oh, he sits, he sits next to me at work. Okay. Um, but uh, what I've been thinking about is how do you, how do you help a nonprofit mm -hmm. understand the value or at, of edX or do people are people just finding the Uh. That's a thing that I also think about a lot. That's uh, one of the things that I'm supposed to be doing much better at than I am right now. Um, we, a lot of people come to us. We do do some kinds of outreach. Not a lot of it is targeted. We're working on doing more of it. What this looks like is um, going to more conferences where you know people will be kind of keeping track of who's uh, talking about education and like where people are working on trying to reach out to people to, I'm going to say teach them things, but they, you know, there's a lot of nuance to what teach them things means. Um, 
we've been talking with different groups who kind of uh, manage multiple nonprofits or, or help out multiple nonprofits, people who provide technical support for them. It's so like, hey, we do this thing. I think it would be really cool if you wanted to install it on your server and help people to do so. <laughs> Many news reports about edX uh, specifically comments about how students experience are not continuous in some sense. In other words, they sign up after a few months, everything kind of fizzles out. Is that something you guys are thinking about and what solutions are you thinking about? Um, as a problem, that is something we think about a lot. That is also something that we've resigned ourselves to because sign up is super easy. Right? You click two buttons. Um, so when you look at your um, your completion rates, I think 5% uh, completion from sign-up is considered really good. If you start looking at your completion rates after people finish the first exam, not even, not oh, sorry, not finish, take it. Like, they don't have to finish it. As long as they've opened it up and answered at least one question, that number jumps to 30% of a completion rate. Um, things that we've been doing and things that other people are doing is uh, they're making shorter courses, right? Uh, length is a huge problem for a lot of people. Um, the time requirements to finish a course is also huge. Um, Harvard has run courses where they say this is going to be eight hours of work a week and people are like, I can't do that. Um, and at the same time, you have uh, Berkeley running a course that's 16 weeks long, and you also can't expect people to commit to 16 weeks uh, if it's something they're basically doing for fun in addition to whatever else. Uh, so shorter courses, uh, smaller bites of information, um, we have a mobile platform now that has also made a huge difference, um, which really looks like you can watch your videos wherever you want, um, which has made it, it's been astounding. So what's the completion rate of the self-paced courses? Um, I don't know. That's the first answer, is I don't know. Um, I would argue that all the courses are self-paced. Uh, once you sign up for one, you continue to have access to the materials even after the course is closed, unless they decide to take it down. This does happen on a case-by-case -case basis, which some people do decide to do, um, to take them down or to restrict access after this ended. Um, I don't know what they are for. But you can get certificated. No, yeah, the certificates are so there are there are certificates. Uh, there are two kinds of certificates. There's just the I finished it certificate, and then there's a honor code certificate, which you pay money for. Um, uh, but this also varies case by case. There's um, Peru. There's a school in Peru um, where you can do all your coursework. You don't even have to be a student there, but you can go in to take an exam in person, and if you pass it, you will get credit and like a fancy, super fancy student there. Um, I don't know what those completion rates are like. Have you seen in, like people from the third world they using these kind of tools? Yes. Um, both in terms of the platform and the courses. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I can kind of roll off specific cases of things people are doing. Um, uh, there's a use of vocational training. Um, there's a big, big thing in rural parts of India. It's this huge project the government's doing um, to do teacher training, but also to be doing student training. Um, there's a Norwegian group who put together a uh, um, lab simulations that are being used like in rural schools in less developed countries um, to bring that part of the education experience because you can't you can't set up a, like a bio lab in uh, a lot of I know that like part of this has been implemented in parts of Ghana it's like in rural Ghana you can't set up a bio lab um, but you can have virtual simulations of one that are pretty good how, when, when should I stop answering questions? Um, you did the whole So I think one more question. So similar, a similar platform, uh, the city, they, they care about um, connecting this education to employment. So they try to join you with like mm -hmm. folks and speak on money and stuff. Is that something you guys care about or you just want to provide a platform? So I care about providing a platform. Professionally, that is my, that is like what I do. What I care about personally is different. Um, when it comes to providing a platform, that's not something we're concerned about, though we are delighted when we see cases of that. Um, uh, there have been uh, companies that have run courses and said that if you complete it with a certain success rate, 
uh, you have the opportunity to then apply for an internship there. So they're using it instead of like a certain. They're looking at it as a as a as a as like a, a gate that is not be a student at a fancy school. All right. I think that was a very really? good uh, presentation. Willow, what what would be next? I think your mic. Yeah, ne next would be me finding the mute button. Mm -hmm. um, if if Debbie would be willing to go, and then and then Tamara. Okay. All right. Thank you. If I stand here, Willow, can you see me fine? Yes. Can you both see me fine? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm Debbie Chacha, I'm at Owen College, which is in fact a student, we have students at our fancy school. The, um, it's a engineering school, it was founded, actually our, third, our tenth class just graduated a couple of weeks ago, so we're a new engineering school, um, it's just outside Boston. We were founded, we were chartered in the late 19, in 1997 I think is our charter, um, and our first class graduated in 2006. The mandate for our school was this idea that we need to teach engineering differently that um, the sort of Cold War model of what education is. Um, actually, how many people here are technically trained? So in, in math, engineering, um, anything like that. Economics would be a good example. OK, so a bunch of you, but not all. So the sort of standard model is you sit in classrooms, you listen to professors talk, you write down notes, you do problem sets, you write exams. Typically, there are right answers and wrong answers. There's not a lot of gray area. You almost never interact with other people, including the other students in your class. It's often discouraged that you interact with people in your class because you're supposed to do work by yourself. Um, and um, at the end of it, you get a degree. And you go off and you work for IBM for 50 years until you retire. But of course, that's not happening anymore. So that's part of the idea of what the idea that engineering is changing, the way we need to educate our students needs to be different. So that's where we came in. When we started, um, so, so we're unusual in a number of ways. So we're an undergraduate college. We have about 350 students right now. Um, when we started, the idea was that people would pay, uh, would have their tuition paid in perpetuity um, because of the, the financial crisis in 2008. It is currently, we pay half our students' tuition. We, there are plans afoot to try to bring it back up to full tuition. Um, we have an institutional commitment to gender equity. Half our students are female, um, which is unusual for engineering school still. We um, are a tiny undergraduate college. We kind of think of ourselves as a liberal arts college. Um, and we are the exact opposite of skill, right? We are about a place where you go, and it's where people are, and that's what you do. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So when we started the college, the idea was that, um, you know, we thought about what we would do, and it's like we want to have project-based learning, and we want to have authentic engineering experiences, and we want to have students think about entrepreneurship, and we want them to, um, to think about uh, sort of people and context. So they're going to take humanities courses. We kind of did all this stuff. Over the last 10 years or so, in part because a number of myself and a number of my colleagues have been sort of much more deeply immersed in education research, um, that we've sort of recontextualized what we do and how we do. And now I would say there's actually a few sort of major sort of guiding principles for how we think about what our students do. And we are now working with institutions around the world to help them rethink what they do with their students. So by far the most important is the idea of intrinsic motivation. So there's a really common conception to think about, about students or think about people as being motivated or not motivated, right? It's an intrinsic quality of who people are. And so people always talk about motivated students and, um, you know, well, you're, you know, your students are super motivated, they're super smart, and your students are, like, not so motivated. And of course, the reality is, and again, this is sort of in, um, based in sort of research, um, the, the sort of lay book I'd recommend is DC and Ryan's Why We Do What We Do, um, D-E-C-I and Ryan, the usual spelling. So the idea is that we, so instead of thinking about what people do, think about the motivation for why they do. So we do lots of things that we choose to do um, voluntarily, and there's a whole bunch of things that we do because we have to, right? And so, you know, um, uh, you know, I, we think about examples of doing this. So, like, the absolute sort of, um, you know, the totally convincing motivation is someone puts a gun to your head and says, do X, right? You do X, right? That's highly motivating, except that that's a terrible thing to do, right? There's no question that that's terrible. Um, even leaving aside, like, the sort of violence and coercion aspect, even if you say, like, do something for this external thing, it actually feels really coercive to people. Um, people 
Um, so those are sort of extrinsic, um, and they sort of extrinsic motivation space. There's something called extra external regulation, which is when you choose to do something, um, even though you don't really enjoy it, um, because you know it's the right thing to do. So I have a colleague, my colleague and I have opposite views about going to the gym. He's like, I don't really like going to the gym. I go to the gym because um, I, you know, I want to stay in good shape, so I could basically like do this thing for this larger good. External regulation choosing to do it. And then there's intrinsic motivation. So being motivated to do things intrinsically is the thing that we sort of associate with. Um, so think about learning how to play the guitar, right? So has anyone here, so has anyone here taught themselves how to either play an instrument or to do sort of art, creative stuff? And video games is my other favorite example of that. People play video games? Okay. Um, wow, you're like a, this is a crew that's like really focused. The, so think about, so I, mean, I, so I taught myself how to play bass. I started teaching myself how to play bass. It's not a thing that has an endpoint. When I went on the battle um, a few years ago, because I moved to Seattle and I didn't know anyone in a rain all the time, it seemed like a good opportunity. And so when you, learn, when you learn how to play guitar, you're basically choosing to do it, right? You're choosing when and how you want to do it. In my case, it was like Saturday afternoons. Um, you are usually doing it for a reason, right? That, and often that reason is, um, often that purpose is linked to community. So you choose to do things because people around you would, were, you know, that sort of it's part of being a it's part of a community. The class to play guitar, the classic example was like play guitar around the campfire with your friends, right? Is like why you learn how to play guitar. And so you can also tell that you're getting better at it, right? So I would like play a piece and I would stumble and then I would play it again and eventually I would go through it and I could tell that I was playing it, you know, reasonably well. So in order to be intrinsically motivated um, to do something. This is DC and Wright argue. You need basically several components. And one of the components is autonomy. You need to be making your own decisions about what you do. Another component of it is a purpose, right? Just to know why you're doing the thing that you do. And DC and Ryan, this, this often takes the form of community, right? Doing things because it's, it's something that you want to do as part of the group you're in or for the people around you. And the third piece to be intrinsically motivated is capital, right? Is to basically have some kind of competency development that you know you're actually getting better at something you can see you're getting better at something. Um, I have still a graphite on my hand because I just came out of a, a five-day drawing workshop immediately before this. And you know, you as you draw and like as you practice, like after 20 hours of practice, I can tell by looking at it that my work is better than it was. And it was in fact a faculty development workshop at the college, um, taught by a colleague of mine who's a biologist and an artist. So, and none of us had to be there, right? We all chose to be there because we, we wanted to do this and we wanted to get better at it. The so in order to be interested in motivated, typically you need these three things. And education is really, really good. Traditional education is really good at providing the scaffold. Right? It is not very good at anything else. It is not very good at providing students with autonomy, and it is often not very good at providing students with purpose, right? The why you should do this. But what it is really good at saying is like here is a structured way to learn this content. Right? That you basically it's like we're gonna give you like harder and harder exercises, you're gonna learn more and more stuff. The courses, you know, the grade, you know, grades, whatever to grade eight math, then you go to college or you know, high school and college, and everything stacks up. Highly structured, highly scaffolded. What it doesn't give you is motivation, right? So the people who are good students are the people who are not. It's not that they're good students because they are motivated. They are good students because this system motivates them, right? They work well under this particular in this particular context. So one of the things we spend a lot of time thinking about is creating. Um, learning experiences that actually allow students to be intrinsically motivated. So that basically provides autonomy, provides purpose, and provides scaffolding to let them actually be motivated to do things. So rather than thinking of motivation as a property of our students, to think of creating learning experiences that foster intrinsic motivation. And there's a couple of things that follow this, right? So one is this idea that, um, so one of the things that I find really disturbing about sort of online courses is that the people who succeed at those courses are the people who traditional education already serves really well, right? It's like typically it's people who are college educated. And we have not, we don't really have a lot of educational options for people who, who are not well served by the traditional system, which is why we spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, so that's sort of one of the key things. The other thing is that it actually is associated with really good learning outcomes, right? That basically students who learn stuff because they're just really motivated to learn stuff have much better learning outcomes. They learn better, they recall better, and all those things. So even like those, by using those sets of metrics, right, being students who are intrinsically motivated get much more out of their learning experiences than students who are just sort of following the pathway. And again, I mean, I've definitely had the experience of 
took a course, studied for the exam, wrote the exam a year later. If you ask me, like what I learned for that exam, I cannot tell you. On the other hand, it's been you know a long time, the better you know two decades and change, and I can tell you what I did for my senior thesis project because it was something I chose to do. I went and I like knocked on the door of a physicist at a different university and said I want to work on this project. And so if you ever want to know about the Silver Neutrino Problem Observatory and the the Neutrino Problem, the Solar Neutrino Problem, I'm happy to tell you. Haven't looked at it for 20 years, right? It's, but it's the thing that I chose to do by myself. So now when you go back to how we're teaching engineering students, right? When we think about things like project-based learning, it's not just because they're doing hands-on stuff and they're doing project stuff. It's that because project-based learning is in a, is a um, type of learning that really allows students to make sure they can motivate, right? It basically means that they get to choose what they want to do, so they have a lot of autonomy. They get to um, they often, you know, they 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 choose sort of choose what they do, which gives them purpose. They often choose um, how they're going to do it, which gives them autonomy. And then our job as educators is to actually provide the scaffold, right? Is to provide the way for them to step through it and get better and better at what they do. And so, um, so there's, that's sort of one key piece in terms of how we think with educating our students. The other things that are sort of related to this are things like lifelong learning, right? Is the ability to sort of go and find information by yourself. Um, if you do project-based work, everyone is doing different projects, so they tend to use digital media perfect, really, um, really extensively. So it's no longer, I'm, the, I'm never the authority in my classroom anymore, right? It's like I'm the person who's creating the structure in which you go out and you're the authority. And that means students need access to all kinds of digital things online. Um, it's really about community, right? It's about very much about the interaction that the students have with each other. So as opposed to the model of education that is me broadcasting, to my students and everybody sort of sits there and possibly absorbs it. Um, it's really a model where a lot of the learning actually comes with students engaging with the project and engaging with each other. So one of the things, so we do we do work with other institutions. And I guess the other important thing is that design, human-centered design, is ended up being sort of a key strain of what we do. So a lot of the projects and what a lot of what people do is in the context of doing it for actual humans. What we do now, and this is I have the same sort of problem as you do, Adam. Right, is that now we're, we are thinking about scale. And the, for us, the question is, how do we scale this? How do we sort of teach people? And we've done, we've done a ton of work. But in our case, it's like, here is a set of principles for how to think about engineering education, not curricula at all. Right? It's like, because we want the same thing that you said about teachers being autonomous learners, um, we want our, our, the educators to be that. And we want them to create environments to let students be that. And so what we're working on is um, basically you know, figuring out how we can scale this. I think I'll wrap things up there. Great. Let's take some questions. Yes. Any particular reason because um, this is starting to hear about it? Um, so not very much of what I said other than the very beginning was engineering specific, right? So. Um, the, so that's basically the idea that if you think about this as a set of principles, then you can think about how would you apply it in your own environment. And Adam effectively already talked about applying it in this sort of ethics and civic thing about how you get people engaged, how they relate it to their own life and their own community. Um, and then the teacher's position is providing the scaffolding that allows them to investigate it. And you know, very similarly, it's like everything needs to be sort of context specific, which is why you don't provide the curriculum, because it's really responsive to that particular group. And that's why we call it scaffolding, really, more than curriculum. But yeah, no, it's not engineering specific. It just happens to be the space in which I work. Yes? Um, <clears throat> how are you finding the continuity as the existence sort of continues? Like, when it started, you had this vision, and people came in and embodied that vision. You had that. And as people go through it, and it's none of the same people as the beginning, are you finding that it's changing at all, or are you able to serve sort of the uh, so I've actually been there since our first class started this sophomore year. So there's actually a reason about a continuity at least at the faculty level. Yeah. Um, oh, the, yeah. yeah. And so, but the students, of course, um, are new every year. Yeah. Um, there's so so continuity is a is is both a virtue and a vice, right? So um, we when we started, we thought that we'd sunset the curriculum every five years. It is way too much work to throw out your curriculum and start it again. Getting the first one up nearly killed me. So, um, so now we actually sort of take chunks of the curriculum and basically think about how to evolve those. And so there's always, I mean, I think of it as you live in a large house and we don't do a gut reno every five years. What we actually do is say, okay, we're going to work on this wing, right, and we can live in this space and then, you know, basically systematically, you know, uh, renovate the entire house. 
but yeah, so continuity is my problem. Trying not to have continuity is a lot more work. Uh, like how do you handle evaluation? Yeah, uh, so um, so our student, we actually had a huge fight at the beginning about whether or not we have grades. Um, and because there are excellent arguments to not have grades, there are also fairly good arguments to have grades. Um, I think of grades as basically an API, right, that allows Olin to interface with the rest of the world so that our students can go to grad school or, well, grad school is the big one. Um, some of it, a bit of it is getting jobs. The, we handle evaluation most, like most other people handle evaluation, we just use different rubrics for what we're going to do. So, um, and there's sort of two pieces to that, right? One is, one is things like design, where we have detailed, or communication, right? Where we have detailed rubrics for what people are actually doing that don't, that doesn't lend itself to like right or wrong anyway. The other thing is, um, like part of it is accepting the fact that even like even if you have a math exam, right, that not only has right and wrong answers, there's an enormous amount of sort of gray area in it. So for example, if you do a complicated math, math equation and you make a sign error, right, you put something that's positive relationship in minus, do you take off half a mark because it's a trivial error, or do you give them zero because I got the wrong answer, right? Like everything is a judgment call about what you're going to do. So um, so the idea of like well how do you evaluate? It's like recognizing that's a judgment call. And the idea is you have rubrics and you have sort of um, understanding of what people are what people are doing. Having said that, we're an accredited institution, um, so we have an accredited engineering degree, and so part of that is actually showing that our students genuinely like learn and change things in a range of things that the accreditation body is interested in, including quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, communications, teamwork, and so forth. Um, and so we actually do sort of demonstrate that at the institutional level as well as relatively traditional at the at the medium height, relative to, relative to traditional grading, at the lower level, quite different grading of our students, and then at a high level, basically mapping into um, the accreditation. One last question. The collective purpose of engineering in society, is that part of your Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we could do a better job of it, but it is definitely part of it. Yeah. So, so do you have a question, or is that, that was that a question? question. I mean, you talk about individual purpose, so yeah. part of the question is how you link that individual purpose with the collective purpose. Yeah, and that's actually where, um, so the individual, because individual purpose is often related to community, right, it's like you do something because of your community, part of that is actually getting people to think about what your community is, right, and taking it from 10 people around you to a global level. And again, you know, thinking about, and again, so what, what happens to thinking about it at different levels, or what Molly, the idea of having edX for different environments, right, having learning communities in different spaces. Um, the, so part of the, so the big, the other big sort of thread through the curriculum is design, and specifically user-oriented design. So it's really about sort of learning about people who are not like you, right? Giving you the tools to do that and to think about larger things. There's, there's a humanities stream through the curriculum, so all our students take humanities courses. This is something which I think, and you know, there's things like affordable design and entrepreneurship. It's, a, it's an engineering capstone which students go to underserved communities to work with that. This is something I think we could do a lot better at, right? Like I feel like our students should graduate as sort of like real sort of solidly global citizens, and I'm not sure that they do at this point. Um, but that's certainly something that's on that's certainly something that's on my radar. Fine, that was the final question. And uh, we can um, switch to Tamara here. Willow, is that okay with you? Yeah, this is great. All right, great. Thanks. Okay, so Everyone ever able to see and hear me okay? Yes. In the room? Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm the co-creator of a kindergarten through 12th grade online private school, school yeah. worldwide. It'd be great to see. People. Yes, that's better. I was looking at a blue wall. <laughs> Blue's great, but I want to see people. <laughs> uh, so anyways. I'm sorry, I'm distracting myself now. So this school uh, is called Krista McAuliffe School of Arts and Sciences, and again, K through 12th grade, both regionally and internationally accredited. And of course, this is when my battery decides it's going to die because I've been on here for so long. So I'm going to switch to because I've been here watching you guys for so long. So and also, I have been traveling quite a bit. So um, I hope that I found the quietest place that I could. It does include a lot of grandfather clocks in here, so I apologize in advance okay. because not more than 10 minutes has gone by since the clock has been going off, and so you will end up hearing this. <laughs> 
So can you guys hear, see me okay still? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I just flew in to San Diego from JFK last night. Uh, so anyways, with this goal, I'm really interested in a lot of what you have said um, because it matches a lot of what we're doing with our school. Um, you know, we're accredited. Um, when a lot of the online schools went down when it came to NCAA eligibility, we were one of the few schools left standing. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because of how our learning model is. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, we are mastery-based and self-paced. Mastery-based means um, that we do expect them to reach a certain level. Uh, for example, if you if you were to get 60% in algebra or pre-algebra, how ready are you for algebra? You know, getting a D minus won't work. So we make sure it's 80% or higher. But how we do that is we make sure that they're learning and we have them demonstrate that learning, not just through multiple guests, but it actually show us that they are learning different things. Um, it's also self-paced. And that means that they usually, especially at the high school level, take one or two classes at a time. And as soon as they're done with one, they can start another one. They might finish um, two years worth of and using math as an example within a year if they're able to move that quickly, but they might take an entire semester to do um, what would normally be, a, uh, or entire year, told you that, to do just a semester class because they needed to take longer because it's all about the learning. Uh, a comment was made at the previous presentation about grades. We don't do extra credit. We also don't take off points for things being late. The grades need to measure to be a reflection, a reflection of the measurement of mastery. And so that is a very important thing. And sometimes we need to untrain teachers in their previous thinking about what grades are to be reflecting because we want to make sure that the students feel like the grades are a reflection that they are in control and empowered in their learning. So the grades, the mastery needs to really reflect the learning. And I could talk way too long about that, so I'm going to move on. Um, when I say self-paced, I do mean, like I said, you know, they can take one or two classes at a time. Some take more. It's a year-round school. They create their own school calendar. They decide when it is they are going to take their vacation time even. It is all about each individual student. Um, when it comes to teacher roles, the teachers are more of the guides instead of the holder of all the knowledge. Uh, we do have instructors who are subject matter experts, and then we also have another type of uh, teacher who is that personalized education coach, that that mentor and that guy that takes care of the whole child. They're also they're they're an advocate, the first point of contact. the The goal is to move students from being used to being on a system that's more about conformity to being more student centered, on to being student driven. The ultimate goal in this is personal agency, empowering them to complete personal agency and so that they are prepared for that world that they are going into. Um, what that looks like, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, how do we prepare students for a future that we can't even imagine? I mean, we can imagine it, but how accurate would, it, would we be? I mean, 10 years ago, would we imagine that we are doing some of the things that we're doing right now? Um, and so preparing those students for beyond when they leave us and they're no longer with our school and they, they go on into their careers. Uh, and so that, that is a big part of it too. So what happens also with our, with, um, our mastery-based system is students can take classes exactly as is from top to bottom or they can modify it. Maybe they want to modify a lesson and they want to try learning something a different way or they want to uh, demonstrate that learning a different way. They can do that. They can also take the learning goals of a class and they can design the class from the ground up to be completely different than what we had presented using all the different resources that we've made available and sometimes the students have access to resources uh, on their own. Our students are all over the world after all. So, you know, whatever they have in their own local communities or whatever they have access to, perhaps even through, through their parents sometimes. Um, our students are, um, many of them are very are neurodivergent um, in many, many different ways. Sometimes that's coming with labels that some would call learning disabilities. We would call that learning differently. Uh, and that can be because 
they are dyslexic or visually talented. Um, uh, some of them are, uh, are Aspie, Asperger's. Um, many of them are very creative, outside the box, or innovative thinkers. Um, you get your artists, your performing artists, or your children of performing artists who are traveling. We have had kids on Broadway. We've had kids who are professional athletes. A uh, great example of um, designing a course to fit would be a surfer who took a, a physics lesson and decided that what he was learning could apply to this surfboard that he was wanting to redesign. And so he was able to apply it and demonstrate his learning that way, and that worked in that, for that particular lesson. Most of that class he did from top to bottom as is, but for that lesson he adjusted it. However, for the marketing class that he was taking, he completely took that class and the learning goals of that class and applied it to the marketing of that surfboard. And now that he's a world championship surfer, that works really well for him. Uh, so that's one of many, many examples. So this school works really well. Uh, we have students who are being successful in many ways that you can define student success, whether that is by the grades or by their own personal feelings. A lot of them come to us feeling kind of bad because they are outside the box thinkers or culturally speaking, they didn't fit in with their local culture. So we have to detox them. For a while, you know, that get get them to to come into their own and, and have that that strong sense of self and, and sense of empowerment and yes, really, really, we really do mean that they can do the things that we say they can. Uh, so that's part of it. Um, another measurement of success would be college acceptance. Many of them are university bound, and we've had uh, an impressive accept, um, acceptance rate um, even to top colleges um, and with scholarships. So measuring it that way as well. Uh, and also now we're starting to get noticed by third parties who are looking at online schools and ranking. Um, a recent one was uh, an organization that was looking at the online diploma granting schools that are out there and they picked the top 50. We made number five, for example. There are other lists out there, but that's one of the recent ones that happened. So. Yay for us, right? We, we've done this. We have a lot of happy students. We're doing good. Um, if you want to see the story as to how this all developed and what went into the creation of this, um, you can either email me or visit my website at TamaraExcel.com. And I finally put the story up there because people kept asking me to. Um, so it's just under my bio there. I have a couple links to the story in the background so you can learn more about that. School is linked there as well. If you want to check it out, check out the learning model and of course again I'm open to questions because here's where I'm at now. Now that we've done this and that we're successful and we're continuing to grow the school, I want to know how can we get this out there more? How can we do this either helping other people start schools, they can use what we've created as a turnkey system, uh, you know, partnering. We have had some people partner with, with us, like a sports academy did that, and we handle the academics while they handle the sports, for example. You know, whatever ways, I'd like to see some learning centers and some science centers out there that wanted to partner with us. Um, so that's one of the things. And the other thing would be uh, training. I would like to be able to assist in the training or untraining and retraining of the teachers and administrators or parents or anybody wanting to learn about this and take what we've created and then take it to the next level. So that's what I'm seeking right now as would be people that wanted to collaborate and and help spread what we've done because it's been pretty wonderful but I'm just one me and so <laughs> I need some help with that. Thank you very much for um, uh, I'm unable to, to hear that very well, so I don't know. Will, are you able to hear a little better? You might put it in the text box if so. That's Personalized Education Group, but it's um, the website for the school would be cmasas.org. That's Krista McAuliffe School of Arts and Sciences. There are a lot of things out there named after Krista McAuliffe. So be sure to put School of Arts and Sciences in your search. And then if you can see how to spell my name, just TamaraXL.com will get you all those links. You don't have to well, more address. Well, I have a question for you. OK. Um, what, what are the, the socioeconomic makeup of your student body like? 
Okay, that's a great question. Um, because we finally had to create this as a private school, we uh, ha are tuition based. So we do have a lot of students now coming in with a higher, higher ish socioeconomic. We do have a lower tuition than most schools um, like us, about half. Um, actually, we haven't found any that are exactly like us. That's part of the problem. We have been coordinating with public schools to reach students that are lower income. And when I first applied the, this learning model, I was working with low income kids. We were talking about the type that had the free and reduced lunch. And a lot of kids, I first went in this working with at risk kids, including some that you didn't know where their home was going to be that night. It does work across the board, um, socioeconomic. And other and culturally and otherwise. So I I have done the time in the trenches to have it work, but to actually have the school, um, we tried public school and charter schools. We finally had to create a private school. So now that's the next step is getting it available out there more into the public schools and publicly. Can I have an exact number for what half of a tuition? Like if you're a half, but also of someone who programs. Oh yeah, that's a great question. It depends on whether you're elementary, middle school, and high school, um, and whether or not you are part-time, full-time, and then there's two types of full-time. One runs about 5000 and something on dollars. The one that runs much higher, it's 7000 but that's unlimited number of credits. We do have students that will come to us and want to move much more quickly, and they have demonstrated that they're capable of doing that, and they don't want to pay per credit. So it actually ends up um, more economically viable for them to do that, especially if they're working right through the summer. Per month, per year, per semester? Oh, that's per year. Sorry. Yeah, that's per year. Yeah, we've had we've had schools that have set up uh, either study hall, learning room with computer access and everything for students, and they've found that if they pay the tuition for the student to work through our school, they um, pay less to us than what they get for the student aid um, for ADA. Yeah. So public school funds is more than enough to cover our tuition. Hi. I like caring about the school. I, I mean, and I like the idea of the application of the mastery model for a, uh -huh. a class. What I'm interested in is how do you, you know, how do you struggle with things that are, are a softer skill? Right, that aren't that aren't just kind of performance task assessed. Uh, how do you how do you design a model for some of that ethics? So how do you? I'm going to restate to make sure I understand your question. I think you're asking how do we decide what the learning goals are and whether they're just a bunch of list of things to cover or if they're the big picture ideas. Yes. Is that what you're asking or something else? I love I love that you're talking about a lot of these courses here at least. At least my understanding is that you're looking for mastery, right? You're looking for a, a performance right. mastery, right? And so how, there are some kinds of some kinds of topics that don't lend themselves very well to mastery. I can't imagine. That's you know, true. I'm not mastered ethics. I, I fail I fail every day. So so how do, how does how does one create a mastery like, you know program on content like that? Such as for, for example, maybe going through the scientific process. Is that what you're talking about? Or give me an example. It's easier for me to work with an example. Literature, literature moral, yeah, you know, studying a studying a classic novel, moral, you know, moral ethical dilemmas. Right. So one example that they do with um, studying a novel again, we're K through 12. Um, so they would have some explicit instruction as they needed in whatever concept they were going to study about that. But then they would read the novel, go through the novel, and they would have discussions with the teacher live about the novel. And we would make sure that they understand the things that were presenting themselves through there if they wanted to learn about different literary agents or noticing different things. Or maybe, there, and also there, there's a lot that goes into that, right? Because it's reading comprehension and where's the student at in their ability to <coughs> To understand what's being presented in the literature, whether it's just um, what did the character do versus something more interpretive, which is a higher level type of thinking. And it, we have to take the students where they're at, too, um, depending on their age and their, their development. And the goal is to move them forward as much as possible in that. And, so, and some of the, the literature is going to be more 
uh, difficult than other literature, and they're able to have a lot of say, a lot of choice in that literature as well. We, we make sure that they have a variety, but they have a lot of say in that as well. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not something you're going to fit on a Scantron. Uh, it takes more to do what we're doing. Uh, um, that's, we ask more of our teachers. We tend to pay our teachers better because we're going to ask a lot more of them than in a regular online program. Um, it is scalable. Um, it's just not going to be. We have to have a smaller number of students per teacher when you do that math and look at the ratio there in order to make this work very, very well. However, on the flip side, we are all about empowering the student to work through and ask those types of questions of themselves and be metacognitive with the idea that they go on beyond us and the teachers that they have a problem. So, have a question. Is there any other another question I couldn't hear? Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for this. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have any other questions, just email me. I'm happy to share and take suggestions as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so let's take a 10-minute break. I'm not going to be there to get you all back in the room, so I'm going to ask you to <laughs> please, please self-regulate. Um, do do your things first and then have your conversations rather than, than chatting. I know everybody there is wonderful, but you'll have more time to talk to them. Um, to the three speakers in the room, will you come huddle by the laptop so we can scheme together about what to do after this 10-minute break? <laughs> Thank you. Go, go do things. Yes, go. <laughs> so, Willow, you, you are the herd herder of cats. Is that what I am yeah. seeing yes. here? You're the one that has to <laughs> get her face. I'm, I'm the kitten funnel. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. So, to everybody watching, right now. Um, we will have this uh, still uh, streaming. Um, I think that's because otherwise we'll have to create another um, hangout. Yeah. So we'll be here and uh, we'll be coming back in 10 minutes and in 10 minutes I'll just have this laptop turned around and we'll have all the speakers. Um, I think she wants to conduct this discussion. Yeah, yeah. I'm just making sure that everything's yeah. right. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the engineering team. I think I wanted to see people who are on the call. See you soon. Oh, wait. I, wait, I need, I need that video. <laughs> I want to see everyone. Yeah, it's really hard to not see them. Yeah. I would really let us expand if that's okay. 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 But that being well, said, I, I, actually, I think uh, you can stand. I'm just looking yeah. at the frame. Hello. Why don't you come okay, over? Okay, so it's. So it's a little bit, oh, it's going to be hard for me to hear people just because of the background noise. One, thank you all so much. This is amazing. I'm sorry for not being there in person. Um, hey, Debbie. <laughs> um, so be because after this break, there's going to be a half hour left, um, we can do one of two things. We can either have some semblance of a panel discussion if you all want to talk to each other and have everybody's attention while we do that. Or we can, which I tend to not do, um, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. I think you all would say interesting things to each other. Um, the other idea, um, which I hope you'll throw in on, is uh, to do breakout groups where each one of you just says, hey, if you want to come talk to me further about the topic that I covered, I'm happy to do that. Does anybody have any other ideas of how to approach this? I'm mostly just worried, the thing about breakout, like I know the original plan was to do breakout groups, but I, half an hour seems like an awesome type thing, and I know I have to leave at six, I don't know many people. Okay. Um, the only yeah. thing I, I was thinking about, I think it'd be interesting to see if people, where people would pick up the threads between the three different yeah. presentations. I actually think that they yeah. spoke to each other before, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we certainly spoke to each other a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So then, would it make sense to see how your your different experiences? Because uh, two of you have worked pretty intensively at in digital space and at scale, and two of you are really invested in in the more personal touch. Let's do this intense education of the of the instructors. And so, I wonder about discussing those topics more, 
Right. Um, and, and then having questions from the group. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think that actually would probably work fairly well. The other yeah. thing is that, I'm not sure if you thought, this is actually a fairly small group. Like if we split it into four, like I think there's probably about... We, we might not get a lot of people per person. I, I think it'd be interesting just to even get the questions from everybody as they come and they can address it to individuals or to all of us at the same time or even to the room and just let the conversation happen. The only trick is going to be like, don't forget we're over here on this computer. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow I'm with you. I, was, I definitely wasn't thinking that anybody needs to hear any more from me. I can be part of a conversation. Yeah. yeah. I, I would like to just hear what Sorry. people wanted to, to say and, and suggest and, and ask about and and uh, that I would love to do that because you guys are very interesting. <laughs> I want to hear more about what you have, what you're doing. I'm very interested and engaged. Um, and my concern with breakout groups is people wanting to move from one to another and not having right. a lot of time mm -hmm. to do so. Right. Yeah. Um, because it's only a half hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Break so, out groups later in the future, if we can do something like that for those wanted, wanting yeah. to. I know I could do that, and you guys could probably do that too, right? Just make yourselves available yeah. later. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's so let's do the let's do the um, panel with live Q and A. Can okay. one of the three folk in the room do heavy facilitation? Because it's really hard for me to do that from here. Uh, yeah, I I can do that. As awesome. long as okay. Interrupting them. No, it's good to know that yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and okay. help and help me if I do have something to say. I don't know how to signal that very well. You're projected um, on the waving. <laughs> you will be on the screen large. Yeah. Yeah. The way yeah. you will be yeah. seen. But that, I think that would be what your role would be is to make sure. I don't that know if I want to be large. <laughs> it's like oh no. Normal size. Yeah. Lola's head is like yeah. as big as yeah. it normally is right now. Yeah. Hey. Hey now. <laughs> the idea of <laughs> See, for me, I'm seeing you guys, and then I'm seeing Willow down there. It's this itty bitty little box, and then me is a little box beside her. So I don't know what you're able to see it as. How would you feel about facilitating a conversation? Um, it's not my talent, so okay. I will defer to others. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I would say, however, is that I actually I have something that I would like to add to the conversation, probably for two minutes at the beginning. Okay. Of the next segment, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Awesome. Okay. Um, Sounds good. I'm going to step out. Um, we have five minutes. We're going to reconvene on the half hour. So. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. I'll see you on a little bit. At 2.30. Okay. Yeah. yeah. See you in time. <laughs> Over here at 2.30. <laughs> um, that's a very good question. I'm going to have to shout out for that. So where's your office?
part of um, the, uh, the conversation earlier. So what do you want to do next? So because, so because there's a half hour left, the thing that we're going to do is basically like live panel with Q&A. So group discussion given the size of the group that are, that's there. Um, Molly is going to do take lead on facilitation in the room. Um, and then Tamara and I will be on the screen behind you all. All right. My facilitation theories are about taking stack. So if you have something you want to say, raise your hand. I'll or the pizza in your point hand. you out as a well, favorite. Yeah, 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 Molly, you should let people know what taking stack is because I doubt many of the folk of the room are occupiers. <laughs> well, there, was a brief, there was a brief mention, but I was going to explain more and more people about that. Uh, I think we're going to uh, grab the chest oh, um, and, uh, and also the we'll have like similar there. So, yeah, but we want people here, right? Yeah. So we want chairs. Can we there. move in uh, into this area? Move the chairs. So the training chair. Yes, so I need to move over there. Yeah. I think I just realized. Yeah. Uh, no, no, this is it. Well, I'm looking at what the screen is. Yeah, yeah. The one is on well, the screen. Well, should the screen face them so that and then see everyone else? Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to switch out. So, no, that's good. Just switch it over to the list. Here. Since we only have about, I'm sorry, that's this perfect. is Willow's job to copy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a habit. That's okay. It's close enough. Okay. I know, right? Honestly. Where did I party go? Just to make sure you're here. I think that's about five minutes. There we go. 
Willow will start things off. I'm starting things off. Oh goodness. Um, okay, so uh, sl- thank you all for for staying and sticking around. I hope your break was fantastic. I got some more coffee. It's wonderful. Um, so slight change of plan because we have now 26 minutes left. We're going to do a Q&A group discussion sort of thing. Molly is going to be your in-room facilitator because she can see you and I can only sometimes see you. Uh, she's going to tell you about keeping stack uh, right after Yanir gives us a quick two-minute thought on what else has been up. I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts. Um, one of the things, key issues that has been touched on is individual differences. And I want to talk about that a little bit in a context where the current system is very much driven by standardized tests. Um, and um, uh, this is something that we've been discussing, but I want to jump all the way to frame what uh, I understand a very powerful solution is to these issues. Um, and again, the existing um, framework has an analogy that's been talked about in educational circles for a long time, which is uh, it's like testing animals, like different animals, with the same test, like having all different kinds of animals climb a tree as a test for their abilities, uh, which, of course, doesn't make any sense. Um, it turns out that the biological analogy has a corresponding solution which we can understand and use in an educational context and is not really understood. Because what traditionally happens is people get caught in the dichotomy between standardized testing as the evaluation and some kind of not clear portfolio or other kind of assessment that we otherwise don't want to interpret in a larger context. The solution in biology is called niche selection. What it has to do with is identifying not one standardized test, but a set of, a variety of standardized tests, so that there are cohorts that are able to move through the system challenged by different kinds of of skills and capabilities. We see that at a college level in different disciplines, but we don't actually have a general understanding that that's something that we can exploit, whether it's in um, for you know, younger children, or how to um, set it up as a, uh, in a broader context than just disciplinary boundaries. I just wanted to put that out there um, because I think it's a really important uh, issue. All of the, a, a fair amount of the feedback loops that are limiting innovation in education are driven through this standardized assessment. Thank you. Please. Um, that was really interesting, and I think that'd be a great thing to talk about more. Uh, that's, that's um, so real quick, what we're gonna do is, I think we'll start off with just saying people ask questions, and we'll answer them collaboratively or individually. Um, if you have a question or you want to add to the conversation, you have things to say. Just kind of put your hand up. I'll nod at you, and then when the previous person is finished, I'll call on you. Um, it's called keeping stack. Uh, and if you're talking for a really long time and I feel as though you have drifted too far off topic, I'll say, wow, that was really great. Thanks. Now, um, so-and-so wants to say something, too. So that's the polite way of doing that. Um, and I will try really hard to keep track of Tamara. Can we make her face really big? Uh, yeah. You want to switch from Willow to Click on her little face. Do you don't mind? Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, who wants to lead off? Yay. <laughs> How do you embed trust in the system on an individual level to make some of the decisions that you are proposing? So I actually think that ties in with this idea of systematized, systematized tests, right? About, um, and, and, you know, in the earlier, like, Weller started off by saying education is broken. Right? And it's like, and we all agree with that. And actually, I don't agree that education is broken. What I normally ask is when people say X is broken, I want to know why they are saying that and what they think is broken and like what their motivation is for saying things are broken. And certainly, there are lots of people who have excellent motivation for saying that. 
But one of the reasons why we're happy asking the question about how do we embed trust in education is because we have what Ursula Franklin um, talked about in her book, The Real World of Technology, as factory models of education, right? Where we have individuals who go in, and we are, she talked about it in terms of um, that they all need to come out identical, right? That basically they all have to have the same levels of skills, and this is where standardized tests comes in. Even in a way of standardized tests come in, is basically buying into this factory model that everyone is a widget, and they need to be, we need quality control on our widgets, and they need to come out. The thing that is implicit in that is that education is a, um, essentially it's a for-profit endeavor, right? It's like we're putting money into the system, and we want to make sure that we have an appropriate ROI, right? An appropriate return on investment for our system, rather than treating education as an investment for its own sake, right? That we're investing in this. And the, the other model that she uses is, is the, the garden model of education. So where basically the idea is you have people, you have a bunch of, of plants in your garden, and you invest in them, and they grow, and they all grow into different plants, right? And your job is to provide the nurturing environment for them to grow. And this seems like a really lovely, halcyon, idealistic thing, but the only reason why it's idealistic is because we have decided as a society that education, specifically public education, is not a thing that we spend money on, right? We have decided that this is a thing where all we care about is like getting you know, widgets at the end of it. Um, so, like, there's not a lot of trust in the system because we're not growing a garden, right? Like, we're basically getting widgets, right? It's quality control. So, um, so the answer to the question is how do you get trust in the system is to actually decide that this is something that matters to us, pay our teachers well, you know, come up with, with um, you know, learning experience for our students that aren't do what we tell you, right? And then, and, you know, the thing like that you were talking about, about basically treating teachers themselves as sort of autonomous, purposeful learners and allowing them to sort of contribute um, in that way. And then, yeah, and then it's like, it seems like a fairly straightforward way to get trust in the system, actually trust people. Uh, one, of the, you know, one, of the, one of the challenges, I mean, I really do think that the test conversation is a really important one, because the accountability loop goes from the student to the teacher, the right. superintendent, right? So that if you're a superintendent, and you decide that you value something that is not actually test driven, yeah. The way that your job is measured is not going to line up with your own right. professional values. Which is the problem. Right? right. So what you do is you actually create a system that breeds distrust because what you're doing is the good teachers are actually violating rules. Yeah. Right? And then it's a pain in the neck because their classrooms are loud. They're not going to necessarily <laughs> spend the time on the on the test. It's a, it becomes a real problem. And I and I work at a nonprofit that's full of people that broke the rules. You can imagine what it's like for us to try to actually have a team need it. Because this has created really dysfunctional environments. Uh, Tamara? Yeah, so adding to that, um, we have a lot of students that are coming to us increasingly. Um, and instead of seeking a diploma, they're seeking a different way. Right. Um, a lot of them are, are making their own education, making their own path. Um, some of them go to college without getting a diploma. They skip the diploma for that. Some of them are even even forget the degree. We're seeing an increase in this. And it's because of, well, many, many reasons. But one of the things that you have both hit on um, is motivation. And there's a couple, there are many things that go into motivation. One is whether or not they feel it's possible. And so being able to personalize it to to them can help them feel that it's possible. The other thing is it needs to be meaningful. You yeah. need to have a sense of purpose. That, that, that question that we had, that age-old question, why do we need to know this stuff, is important. And whether or not it really applies to their life. So, know that, so how do we have trust? It's trust in yourself and your ability to guide and, and knowing whether or not your needs are being met because no, it, the trust isn't necessarily in the system. They, they, they will trust what they know and what they feel and what they see. And when they first come to us, there's zero, there's zero trust until we build that with us, but then again, it's still not the big system that they're trusting, it's that they're on their own path. So I guess, uh, I mean, apologize if this part of the uh, beginning. So, can you speak at a bigger Sorry, um, so I apologize, maybe this, uh, this maybe I touched on earlier, but it seems like a lot of the focus on education today is just focus, like, focusing on individual students, and especially um, a lot of the new online models and a lot of the ways in which we I see this, how do we individualize the experience for students so that they get what they are looking to get out of it. And I think one of the things that, um, both in my experience with working with students and also just in general, is that students also tend to work really well when they're working with other students, collaborating on a project. And like, an example for this would be like, 
Um, uh, at Harvard, one of our online classes, CS50, um, they found that of the, of the 50,000 students who signed up, they found like the weird comments emerging where students were doing really well and they were all geolocated. And the professor found out it was actually like small communities of like, you know, 10, 15 kids getting together or 10, 15 people, adults getting together and taking a class together and able to then motivate themselves within this group context to learn well. And so I was wondering, from a systems point of view, like if you're thinking about decentralizing approaches to education, how do we focus on groups of students and empowering groups to learn together? I think this is something that uh, Adam talked about a little bit, which is which is kind of how you're encouraging networks and connecting people into networks. Um, I think when we talk about individualized education, uh, I at least I believe this is definitely true for the rest of you, are talking about how to best serve a learner for their needs, but those needs aren't independent things, right? And it's, it's how do you connect them to each other? How do you uh, construct these networks, or how do you let them emerge themselves? Because you know what you're describing with CS50 um, is you know that that was a naturally emerging property, um, and at least when it comes to the kind of informal education that I work in, uh, for the most part, that is what happens. These are emerging properties of the system. But it is it's one of my biggest concerns. Uh, you know, I I'm sure every, a lot of people have facilitated a lot of online courses, right? One of the things that I've always struck by. And it's, it's creating new habits. It's very hard to get people to listen to each other in a room. It's a little bit easier when people are in a small group. It's really hard when you're in a discussion space, an online discussion space with really lots of people. I mean, I, I've actually seen Institute for the Future have created online discussion spaces that are a little more thoughtful. But in general, I see people individualized, individually post and don't actually pay attention to previous comments. It's like people want to get the words out. So we're going to have to create new habits when we're learning online outside of the room for each other, from each other to actually to, to listen to posted words. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a quick question yes. tied to that. How many of the things you do are synchronous and how many are asynchronous? Most of what we do, everything we facilitate is asynchronous. And our tools are designed for that. Okay. About 50-50. About, about right. So the thing I was going to say is that almost everything, much of what our students do is synchronous. Right, and the thing that I was going to add to that is like knowing that students work to work better together in groups. Why do we create? Uh, why do we think about education as something that's a one-to-one -one thing, right, rather than something that you learn collectively with other people? Um, and so, much you know, the and this is something which um, again I'm sort of interested in is the community aspect of edX, right? The sort of the sort of many-to-many -many piece. And you're right, like something that you know, we're not we're not that good at doing it online yet. Um, especially for people who haven't met each other, yeah. right? There's people who do research on how groups do distributed work, and um, and so the, you know it's pre pretty clear that people who have met and hung out are much better equipped to go and work on things um, remotely than people who've never mm -hmm. met each other. Um, and this is I know this has been exploited by uh, my colleague does, does research in distributed engineering design, and he teaches a course at two universities. I want to say one was here and one was in Europe, and that you know realized that early on that like actually getting people in one room. Made it a lot easier, especially when you're doing it over cultural borders. But fundamentally, I think this is this idea of thinking like we know that being geolocated, having a learning community is a huge has a huge impact. You know, even having a study group, right, has a huge impact on how you learn. Thinking about how we build that into educational um, into learning experiences. So I'm one, I'm wondering about that when you said that there's a difference if people have met. Do you think it's because they've actually seen each other face to face in the same room, or that they've had certain types of interactions? That's an excellent question. I, I have an answer to that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Hear. I'm I'm a I'm a community manager, um, and I find that I found that uh, you have a very different kind of personal accountability to people once you have met them, and I think it has everything to do with feeling as though, oh, that name is actually Tamara. And I've met her, and she's nice. And uh, here are some things I can say about her. So when I'm talking to her, I know who she is, uh, and I feel responsible to her now too. Which dovetails to your point, Adam, about uh, community. And there are, you know, and you know, we, we were talking in sort of broad generalizations here. I mean, there are exceptions to everything. I can think of, um, I can certainly think of online communities that are functioning computer communities where people don't know each other. Um, so Tumblr one is an interesting one. Making light is the one I think about, which is um, a science fiction 
thin community, but you know, routinely has threads that are that are a thousand posts long, that are basically civil, civil and civilized and interesting and thoughtful. Um, so getting away from your problem, the but this, it's hard, right? It's like you can. There are exceptions, um, but certainly, certainly, there's nothing. I mean, people like people have online communities all the time, right? It's like you know, people have met each other online and then meet in person and become friends versus people who are friends and then hang out online. There's like a multiplicity of ways in which human we're like incredibly gregarious. There's a multiplicity of ways in which we're gregarious. The you might be. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, most generalization. Um, the um, and in fact, actually, one of the things is this idea. So the point of having online um, relationships is a very different thing, right? I like going home to an empty apartment, right? But what my apartment is actually has has a whole like a, my my worldwide network of, of community is in it's also acceptable to my apartment. Um, the so there's different things, but the idea. So the real thing is not there's there's a there's a multiplicity of ways in which people. Socially, and the real thing is, how do we actually leverage those ways? Okay, that's that. So I think, in addition to bringing the uh, work together towards it, I think, uh, sorry, in addition to like you know having a study group to work with, I think there's other educational models where you talk about tackling problems as a group and interacting as a group. So like the example I'll give here is uh, for Ackman, uh, which is a large uh, kind of nonprofit that deals with investing in social entrepreneurs. Right. They recently started offering a lot of online courses. Um, right. And we, as part of the, the Ackman chapter here in Boston, we've been looking to distribute these courses. And their model is really simple. Right? They had like, these four-week courses that they push out, and they ask you to take it with a group. Right. Their entire pedagogy is revolving around group interaction. So it's not individual assignments. It's impossible for you to take a class on your own. Right. It's you need to work with a group right. and you know tackle whatever Topic is something storytelling for change. Right. You're telling stories to each other, right. and you're telling stories to the community outside of it. Right. But I think there's a lot of value also within having a group dynamic as part of the pedagogy. Yeah, and that's precisely what I was after. I mean, in our case, we do um, uh, team team based project learning, right? Where like working with other people is part of it. I mean, I find it, I can't imagine teaching ethics without having interaction with other people. It's, right? It's, it's what it's yeah. what concerns me. I'm going to just say one thing really quickly, which is Gordon Alport. 1954, when he wrote *The Nature of Prejudice*, uh, in that he talked about the four conditions to bring diverse groups of people together that broke down prejudice. And I'm really wondering, how do you create these different habits online? So I won't, I won't, I, I don't have all of them off the top of my head. I wrote an article mm -hmm. there that I can steal my book out. But, but it, there's something really wonderful about the diversity of the participants that you're able to get from an online conversation. Yeah. And then the challenge is to actually create places where there's actual work being done together, where I feel a stake in what you have to say. May I jump in? There, there was an excellent, uh, one of the groups that came to Build Peace talked about their online course space where they had a group of people that were all they selected for being from different countries. And they were still learning about standard things, but they would also have conversations about race and about cultural differences and about all sorts of other things. And it was through that that they can show the, the, uh, the tolerance levels gaining. Um, and the, especially because they had data both before and after 9-11, uh, and they had they compared the survey that they did with their students of how they felt about Iraq and Afghanistan, et cetera, afterwards versus the the baseline that was taken for some U.S. survey. And their U.S.-based students were like, "No, I, I think most people from there are pretty are are probably okay," um, whereas everyone else was freaking out. And so those things do happen online, um, but it's probably different. I believe that. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to. I'm just going to throw this out there too, um, kind of along those lines. One of the things that we do with our K through 12th school is we'll have uh, weekly homerooms that students can participate in, um, and they'll talk about different things like what Willa just mentioned and, and engage in different projects together. It's it's not for any particular class. But um, we found that there's a huge value in that for them to be able to connect with their mentor that way, as well as each other. Um, we've also um, started having 
gatherings in different parts of the world where they can get together. The students happen to be in that particular region as well. And so those are great opportunities. But then it's really nice online for them to have the ability to connect with people also through clubs. That's another thing that we've started doing more and more because then they're connecting with people all over the world and getting perspectives um, from many, many different cultures. And, and so I'm getting ready in a few days uh, in San Diego. There's a graduation ceremony that anybody can come, anybody's allowed to come to that can make it. Um, and we try to do a lot to help facilitate students that can't afford it to even um, show up to this. It is amazing to see these kids never see each other in person, see each other for the first time. Sometimes there are tears <laughs> involved. It is a very emotional thing because they have become so attached to each other over the years. So just kind of throwing that out there because I, I love hearing these ideas because obviously we're trying many, many different ways to create that. Um, so always open, open to hearing if there are any other ideas as to how we can do more of that. We have about five minutes left according to the clock. <clears throat> Her name is Rosario, and I would like just to say that we can think about the creation of international motivation because, in my opinion, we can change the system, but after that, how we, you know, how the, uh, the student or they interact together with the, with the teacher, and so the way how they uh, interact, probably they will increase uh, even the motivation inside the room. So, of course, we have to change something in the system because uh, I came from Europe, it's totally different than, than the United States, and very low interact, interaction between you know, the student and the teacher. So, um, I found that probably a mix you know, from the United States and European culture you know, probably is a, a good thing. But at the same time, we have to rethink it and the education system in there. Uh, a small group probably, like you say, um, increase uh, uh, you know, the, the way how teachers interact with the student. And yeah, probably it's not possible to give a single uh, education for uh, you know, personalized education. But probably uh, rethinking the model uh, we talk about, you know, uh, put side, side down, you know, the, the, the university or the school. There are several books from Harvard School and other. So how to rethink, you know, bring students to study at home, you know, you can study during the class. So um, I think that we have to use even more the social, uh, the community and the social system, even the theater, because uh, the theater gives a lot of a lot of opportunity to motivate, you know, the student and to be, you know, be involved in what we have. So uh, probably we are at a very low stage right now, and so we just <laughs> I'd like to know what do you think about this? Then you should do a few other yeah. people to share this with us. One thing, or or anyone else here? Just make sure they they, they yeah. speak up. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone? 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 Okay. Um, um, it's very hard to achieve. Just a little louder, too. Autonomy is is not an easy thing to achieve. And I'm wondering how, because it's it's absolutely true to be motivated, you, you have to have to have some autonomy. No question about it. Um, but how do you do the catch-up work on autonomy in each of your in each of your groups? Because you don't get the fully autonomous. So, I can, I'm going to try to restate this. How do you help people become autonomous coming into projects or coming into these learning situations where 
they're not babies who've never learned before. So, um, so we do this, right? Our students. Um, so what? So the first thing I want to say is that autonomy isn't binary, right? It's something where you can have more and more, um, more and more agency and more and more autonomy in what you do. So it's not like it's an all or nothing thing. Um, the other piece of it, I mean, I've definitely, I've talked to people who are like, oh yeah, like, I told my students that they could do whatever they wanted to do for this project. They had total autonomy. And it's like, this was in Singapore. So not a place where people have a lot of experience deciding what they want to do themselves. And so one way of thinking about it is that the autonomy piece is to be scaffolded like any other learning piece, right? Mm -hmm. That you basically can start with, with, okay, you can, you know, we do this in our first year, first semester. It's like, you came from a traditional undergrad or a traditional K-12 program. You're going. To, we're going to teach you how to take more responsibility. Um, uh, Tamara, you talked about this too, right? Teaching people to become self-reflective learners. Basically, part of that is autonomy, right? Making your own decisions about what you're going to do. And we we scaffold that the way we scaffold everything else, right? So we start with things where there's more more um, more scaffolding, more us telling you you're going to work on this assignment, this assignment, this assignment, and gradually there's less and less. Right, until they graduate and hopefully they're making their own their own decisions. But yeah, so when so but it absolutely there was absolutely a transition. Right? Our first semester is pass no credit for a reason. Um, and part of it is to help people make this transition from being told what to do to what not to do. But it's worth remembering that it's actually incremental change makes a difference. Right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's like giving people more um, more dis, uh, decision making power makes a difference. So, I mean, it's inter it's built into our educational model, so we're facing history in ourselves, right? And so, so you know, I, went, I used to work with the School of New York, who was all, it was an international school. It was all the kids that scored below 25% in the statewide language test. They were amazing kids, but they just didn't speak English very well. But the teachers were these fabulous teachers who believed that you didn't introduce content to the kids. It all was supposed to bubble up. Well, these kids were from different countries. No common experience. There, there was, you know, what was going to bubble up? So sometimes the argument was you needed actually to introduce something to bring to bring the ideas out. And kids demanded to be challenged. They wanted ideas out there for them to react to. So some, so I think the question is how much space you give up. You should be giving up a lot of it, but you can't give up all that space, or else you haven't. Challenge kids to think about something different. Otherwise, otherwise, they'll spin in their own circles. Um, th I want to add something that's not about education, but it's about technical communities, which face the same problems. Um, you get people involved. You make them feel like they have power and skill and ability. You encourage them. You point them to things that they can handle themselves, and you give them the tools to handle them themselves. And in a technical situation, this is, hey, this is how you make a contribution. This is like how you give your code to someone else. Um, and you just give them more responsibility over time as they are ready to take it. So when someone completes a project, and you're like, great, that was awesome. Hey, can you look over this other person's project? OK, you think I'm awesome? Great. Can you like hit this button to make it official? Great. Um, so it's the, these slow steps of building by just adding more responsibility. So I'll just add to that because all of that was really good. Um, it depends. It really does come down to what is this situation, what is this learner, where are they at in their lives, both emotionally and academically and whatever. And yes, especially all the skills, whether they're academic skills or social skills or anything, anything that they gain is still a gain. Take them where they're at and move them forward. Um, I'm just going to throw out, I just met Sugatra Mitra recently. Um, and so if you haven't heard of him, go check him out in the School in the Cloud because one of the things he talked about is getting out of kids' way. Um, that's one way. That's not the only way. Um, but I also like what you talked about with scaffolding. Absolutely that. Um, uh, taking them and what we do is we start off an intro course where we help them become more self-aware of themselves uh, as learners and what their needs are. I hear a lot of talk also about group work um, and project space and that's great. Um, but then Adam also talked about niche construction. That's going to look different for different people. For some people, that is a great source of tremendous anxiety and a whole lot of other things going on. So um, being able, and of course, that's going to perhaps govern what types of careers they go into that you might not see them, perhaps, in a certain field as much. But when it comes to working with individuals, helping them find out what is going to work for them, for some of them, that might be a little bit more independent work, especially at the beginning instead of throwing them into a social situation where um, they're going to flounder and fail and 
um, have it reinforced these negative ideas about themselves as learners. So just wanted to throw that caution out there. No matter how brilliant an idea is or how well something works, it's not necessarily going to be something that needs to be applied for every single student because we, we need to, to look at the individuals in that case. Yeah, and in fact, I actually, I actually do research on self-efficacy. Um, so basically how students de develop this. And, and so one, one strategy is people do work individually um, to get that sort of individual feedback on what they're doing. But I mean, which is sort of the, the core idea is that none of these things, there is no magic bullet, right? There are, people are different, uh, strategies are different, there are principles and approaches and ways of thinking about it, and there are things that have sort of come up in this, right? We've talked about, about students as autonomous learners, we've talked about lifelong learning, right? There are sort of common principles for how you think about things, the actual strategies that we use are going to be sort of widely varied. And so figuring out, you know, how to assess them is another is the other piece of it. Um, Willow, uh, do you want to say a couple of words? And I have just a couple of words of closing. Um, I think you all are great. Thanks for letting us do this remotely. I think you should close it up quick because we're, we're five minutes over. <laughs> So I just wanted to say that we were touched on a subject which I think is very fundamental. This is um, what is considered to be a dichotomy between education as a societal benefit and imperative and education as being about the individual and individual fulfillment. But one of the key uh, points that we have to make from a complex systems perspective is that society in becoming increasingly complex has increasingly diverse roles that need to be played. And in that context, fostering individual fulfillment is, becomes synergistic with the societal imperatives that we have. So given that we actually don't have a conflict between those two, we really need to uh, uh, move education so that it is doing both, because what we're really doing is not doing either at, at the level that it needs to be done. Thank you very much. This is really clear that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, and I look forward to, to much more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willow. Thank you all so much. I'll see you all later.